In this screencast, I want to introduce dynamic programming. Dynamic programming is a general algorithm design technique that allows you to solve opti mostly optimization problems um, where the optimization can be defined by recurrences with overlapping subproblems. And I'll be give some examples of what I mean by that later. Uh, dynamic programming was born in the 50s by Richard Bellman, and there's some dispute over his version of the story of its name. But the, th the only thing it's important here is that um, the dynamic programming really doesn't, um, from a computer science point of view, really doesn't tell you too much about how the technique actually works. Um, from Bellman's perspective, it was the name was chosen as mostly as a marketing tool so that he could get funding for his research. Dynamic programming has lots of different applications in many disciplines, from bioinformatics to information theory to computer science. Um, and there are lots of very famous programming algorithms that get used a lot. Um, one that, if you're interested in the bioinformatics course here, um, Swift Waterman for sequence alignment is a real is was a really important for the development of DNA sequencing. So what is dynamic programming? Well, we've seen greedy algorithms where you build up a solution incrementally, um, and basically at each step you're optimizing using some local criteria. Um, divide and conquer algorithms, where you break the problem into subproblems and then use each uh, use the subproblems to combine into a solution to the original problem. Dynamic programming combines both of these in some sense. It's, it's, or you can just think of it as divide and conquer that is applied when the subproblems overlap or they repeat. So if you try to solve the problem recursively, um, you end up with in many cases, not always, but end up with exponential performance. So the way we solve this is we just keep track of all the solutions to the subproblems as we go along to avoid recalculating them. So the overall idea is very simple. Um, the basic intellectual power comes in with the top-down design of learning how to decompose problems into optimization problems into subproblems that you can use to build up the solution to the larger problem. So again, these are, we're going to have some steps that we go through every time we solve a dynamic programming problem. Um, and the key one is to characterize the solution of the problem in terms of solutions to smaller problems. And after we've done that, conceptually, then we have to write down a recurrence relation that actually captures the decomposition. And then we need to record the solutions to the smaller subproblems as we go along, and we use a table for that. The best way to see all this is obviously, I think, in some examples. And we'll be out doing one example in a lot of detail on this screencast and follow it up with um, a number of other examples for you to look at. That gen there's general agreement that the best way to learn to do dynamic programming is to do it. Um, and so that's the approach we're going to take here. So here's the first example I want to look at. Um, some people call it the coin row problem. Um, it's sort of technical name really is the maximum weight independent set in a path graph problem. The idea is pretty simple. Uh, what's a path graph? It's just a, a graph that's just a linear graph. Um, there's no branching. So for us, it's the coin row problem is just going to look like a set of number, a row of numbers, a sequence of numbers. So we have the sequence of n coins here at 6, um, and these numbers don't have to be distinct. They can be any uh, positive integers for us, um, although they don't actually have to be integers. And the goal is to pick up the maximum amount of money subject to the constraint that no two coins adjacent in the row can be picked up. So hence the uh, path graph is the row. In independent set means that there's no adjacent coins can be picked up. So you might think, well, there are lots of ways to do this. One, just do brute force. Let's look at all the subsets of the coins. 
um, without any consecutive coins in the subset. Well, the problem with that is it's going to be exponential time. So as if the problem size gets uh, even up to, say, 20 or 50 uh, numbers, uh, it's, your program's going to take a long time. In fact, uh, when you get to 50 numbers, it's going to take too long. Um, and then greedy, you might think uh, greedy would work. Um, there's no really good way to do a greedy algorithm that uh, gives you the optimal solution. Um, although in some sense, dynamic programming looked at appropriately is, is sort of a greedy algorithm. But dynamic programming, thinking of it, about it top-down recursively in a dynamic programming approach uh, gives you the insight that you need. And then finally, you could use dynamic programming, but it comes out to be less efficient than the dynamic programming solution. I don't want to spend any much time at this point on the alternatives because I want to get to the meat of what dynamic programming actually is. Okay, so let's look at our example. Um, again, we have six coins, and we can't pick up adjacent coins. Now, let's do a thought experiment where we say, suppose we know the solution for all six coins. Well, if we looked at that solution, either it's going to contain the six coin or it's not going to contain the six coin. So we then we start to think about, well, suppose it does not contain the six coin. Then the optimal value of the first six coins must be the same as the optimal value of the first five coins. Right? Why is that? Because if the value of the first five coins was greater, then that would be what you'd use for the value of the first of the six coins. Um, and by the same token, it can't be any less. So that means that if you don't have the three included, then the best thing you can do is do the best thing that you can do for the first five coins. If it does have the three in it, then what, what's the best thing you can do? Well, then the best thing, if it's got three in it, you can't have six, so it's got to be the best thing for the first four coins. So in other words, you have to subtract two. This is the six coin, so you've got to subtract two from that. So that gives us our recurrence relation. So just pretend for now that n is equal to six. So v of six is equal to the max of v of four. That means that we've included the six coin, so we have to add the value of the six coin to that. Or if the six coin is not included in the solution, then it's just v of five or n minus one. So the solution to the big problem is either one of these two things, and in fact it's gonna have to you're gonna want it to be the max, because you want it to be the maximum value. Now, given this recurrence relation, we have to think about the base cases. Um, and because it goes back two steps, one step or two steps, we need two base cases to get started. And so that means V in, think about what that is. If the, well, if there are no coins to pick up, then that's going to be zero. If there's one coin, if there's only one coin in a row, that's going to be whatever that coin is worth. So the, coming up with the recurrence relation is the hard work. Um, and now uh, we can implement this um, recursively just by translating the recurrence relation. So we get the base cases, k equals 0, return 0, k equals 1, return the value of the first coin, else return the max of uh, v of k minus 1 or v of k minus 2 plus C of, this should be C of K. Sorry, that's a typo. Should be C of K. So, as you can see, once you have the recurrence relation, it's pretty easy to come up with a recursive program that will solve the problem. But you can see the problem that arises when you draw the call tree out for this. So v of 6 is going to have to call v of 5. That's v of n minus 1. And then v of 5 is, and also it's going to have to call eventually v of 4, which is v of n minus 2. v of 5 is going to have to call v of 4 and v of 3. 
etc. So this is very similar to the uh, tree that you get in the Fibonacci numbers, if you're familiar with that example. So what you've got, notice, is if you look at uh, this particular, and I left a little subtree out over here, but if you look at this side over here, for instance, or look at this subtree, right? That's identical with this subtree. So that's what we mean by overlapping and repeating subproblems. So if you just do the straight recursive naive approach to this, you end up with an exponential time complexity. So that's not going to help for large problems. So how do you get around this? Well, there's two ways. Um, fill in the table iteratively, and that's illustrated here. So in other words, you start out, you've got value 0 and value 1, there's the base cases, and then you just compute the values uh, further up by uh, using the recurrence relation. So the way in pseudocode, the way this looks is v of 0 equals 0, v of 1 equals c1, and then you have a loop from 2 to n, and you just said v of i equal to the max of v of i minus 1 and v of i minus 2 plus, again, I made the typo, c of k. Okay, so that's a relatively straightforward implementation. The other approach is to use something called memoization. So all that memoization means, it's a, just a fancy term for, okay, you're going to, once you find an answer, you're going to write it down and never recompute it again. So you're just going to save answers as you develop them and then never recompute. So you need to cap, keep track of whether or not you've got an answer. And so we're going to, when we create our array to contain the solutions, um, our table, we're going to initialize the values that we don't know yet with, with a flag, say something like minus one. Um, and then the code actually looks pretty simple, and we can do it recursively. If v of k equals minus 1, then you have to call because you don't have its value. But if v of k is not equal to minus 1, well, then you have its value, and you just return v of k. So this is very simple code. Um, the downside of this is, of course, for large problems, you're going to have uh, a big call stack and potentially uh, use up a lot of space. So just to recap, um, we did a thought experiment. Um, what decisions or options would lead to a solution in the coin row? Namely, in this case, it was the solution either ha does or does not have the last coin. And then if you knew this, the best solution for n minus 1 and n minus 2 coins, you could then determine what to do about the nth coin by taking the max of the values in the recurrence relation. And again, this is just a, the proof. The proof is typically that I just informally outlined is what's called a cut and paste proof because you just cut out um, the, see what happens if you cut out the uh, solution to the smaller sub problem and then paste it back in. What are the implications for what the overall solution to the bigger problem is going to be? So let's do our example. Um, again, same old example problem. Now we're going to build this up iteratively. So we start out, we've initialized v of n with 0 and 5, um, and then we need to compute v of 2. So how do we compute v of 2? Well, we see what the, what's bigger. The solution for one coin, with, so we don't use the 5, the 1 here. If we don't use the 1 here, then we... Uh, could get 5. If we do use the 1 here, then we can only get 0. Okay, so we take the max of those two things and we get 5. V of 3, which is a little more interesting, is, so we're taking deciding whether we're going to take the second coin or not. If we take the second coin, uh, I mean the third coin, sorry, if we take the 2 here, the third coin, then what do we get? We get this 5 here, Okay, that's v of 1. That's two steps back. So 5 plus 2 is 7. If we don't take the 2, then we get this 5. Well, clearly 7 is better than 5, so that's what we get for v of 3. v of 4, so we're here. We want to compute this number. Um, so 10, if we 
pick up the 10, then we get the 10, and going back two steps, we get the 5. So that'll be 10 plus 5. If we don't pick up the 10, then we get 7. So that's better. So we get 15. And we just keep doing that. So you can see, and that's just, we're just following the iterative version of the code there to build that, build up the table. It's all fine and good, but we don't know, once we get the answer, 18, it's not clear which coins we picked up. So what we need to do is we work backwards. We trace back through the table. So you start out with the 18 here, and you say, where did the 18, how did we get 18? Well, we either... Uh, did not pick up the 3, in which case we would have gotten 15. So that can't be right. So 18, we must have picked up the 3 and gotten 15 from this being at the 4-coin problem. Okay, so that means we picked up the 3. So the last coin, C6 equals 3, is in the solution. Now, then we're, we don't worry about V5 because we know we didn't pick up the fifth coin. So we're back here and we say, well, where did this 15 come from? Well, did it come from the 7? In other words, did we not pick up the 10? No, it couldn't have done that. So we picked up the 10. Does that work? If we pick up the 10, then we get the 10 plus the 5. That indeed is 15, so that means we pick up the 10. So, so far, we've picked up the 3, and we picked up the 10. Okay, and so when we did that, we went back to here. Okay, and now we're going to go back to here. And so now the question is, did we pick up the 1 or not? Okay, well, where did the 5 come from? Did the 5 pick up the 1 plus 0? Well, that would only be one. Um, or did we not pick up the one and just get this five? And the answer is obvious. We just get that five. So that means we did not pick up the first coin. I mean, the, the second coin, the one. And we went back to there. And so now, finally, what do we do at this point? Well, obviously, we... Picked up the picked up the five because that was the initialization for the value of one coin. So which coins did we pick up? The coins we picked up were uh, five, ten, and three, and that gave us our total of eighteen. If you stop and think about it here, notice how the traceback is going to work. You're going to have a loop in your code that basically, in some sense, just reverses the loop that you had uh, to build the table iteratively. So it's pretty easy to see what happens um, and, and to write the code. Um, on the other hand, for some problems, in, it's worth it to record uh, whether or not you picked up a coin to get the particular value at each step of the game. But that will, uh, we'll go into that more and once we get to a little bit more complex examples. So filling in the table, simple loop, where each iteration requires a constant number of operations, hence the time complexity is basically linear. Uh, tracing back is also linear since to compute each previous cell takes constant time, and this must be done between n over 2 and n times, depending on whether you're going back by 1 each step or 2. So it's going to be someplace between n over 2 and n times. So it's also linear. So just to remind you what we've done, um, the key step is characterizing the solution in terms of solution to smaller problems uh, and write down a recurrence relation. Once you've done that, then things generally are relatively mechanical. You just fill in a table either bottom up or recursively using memoization. And then finally, you trace back uh, to construct the optimal solution of the problem, or perhaps, as I'll go into later, you'll store the solution um, at each step um, as you go along. You'll still need to trace back, 
but through a different different table. So hopefully that gives you some idea of how dynamic programming works. Um, we'll be going through a couple more examples on future screencasts, and the key is for you to get some practice.